everyone, this is Henry, and it's another Battle Games review, video review. And today, uh, it's not figures or terrain, it's a book. And in fact, I owe this company several reviews because they very kindly sent me several books. But um, this one is going to get a review all of its own because it's, it's quite a beast. Um, and it is more like lions than men. Sir William Brereton and the Cheshire Army of Parliament, 1642-46. to And it's written by Andrew Abram, and it's from Helion's Century of the Soldier, 1618-1721 to series, technically book number 51. It's first caught my eye, actually, and I mentioned it to uh, Duncan Rogers of Helion because of these wonderful flags on the front cover. I just thought it was a very striking piece of graphic design, those beautifully rendered, uh, lovely coloured uh, battle standards against that uh, engraving background. Uh, I just thought it was a really striking book cover. In fact, overall, I love the, the general design for this, these series that Helion do. Being a graphic designer myself, I've got a, an appreciation for this kind of thing, and I just think they're really lovely. Um, let's, uh, I'll tell you if, you, if you're someone who's in, interested in heft, this has got heft, it's quite a beast, let's have a look there, There's, it's quite a thick thing, so what's that, like an inch thick, something like that, um, and in fact, it's, uh, let's have a look how many pages, there's obviously some blanks at the back, fillers, but it's 376, uh, 378 pages or thereabouts, plus um, a few filler pages. So it's quite a monster. Okay. Um, anyway, let's have a quick look at what it says on the back cover, because I think this is important for you to hear. It gives you a really good insight into what's inside the book. While some military historians of the English Civil Wars continue to focus on the national conflict and major campaigns and assert that the consideration of counties and regions was little more than a disconnected series of petty local struggles, several new interpretations about the nature and effectiveness of local forces have challenged this notion. This book describes the parliamentarian armed forces in Cheshire, commanded by Sir William Brereton in detail. Focusing on the military operations, organisation, leadership, pay and equipping of this army, it explores its contribution to the wider regional context. In doing so, it utilises a range of primary sources, many of which have neither been studied before nor published. Although an overview of the broad military campaigns and the regional and more widespread strategy of the conflict are provided, the author concentrates on the leadership, context and nature of the regiments under the command of Brereton and his officers, whilst casting light upon the composition, supply, clothing, financing and effectiveness of what would rapidly become a seasoned and important fighting force, albeit mainly on a regional stage. The book enhances our knowledge of the parliamentary war effort and civil war forces in the northwest and beyond, whilst locating the Cheshire army in its wider military and strategic context. Several new interpretations about the nature and effect effectiveness of local forces, as well as how the parliamentarian soldiers in Cheshire were recruited, trained, led, paid, fed, equipped and clothed, are extensively scrutinised. And they're not kidding! Uh, I haven't had a chance to read the book cover to cover. Let's not be silly. It's a big book. Uh, and also, the English Civil War isn't my forte. I know some people who really do specialise in this period of history. Uh, but I found it absolutely fascinating just to have a bit of a flick through. If we look at the, the contents, uh, you can see... Uh, that it uh, part one is military operations of the Cheshire Army of Parliament, part two identifying, paying, equipping and feeding an army, part three military units of the Cheshire Army of Parliament and a list of colour plates, an extensive list of illustrations and tables, there's quite a lot of tables, a list of abbreviations and explanatory notes and conventions. There's a chronology of the war as it affected Cheshire, starting in 1642 and going through to 1646. 
starts with an introduction. You notice it's quite um, academic in a sense in layout. This is a serious book. You know, this isn't a uh, a book for the general punter, I would say. Although it's not difficult to read, the language is very well and clearly written. Uh, but it is academic in the sense that it has lots of quotations, lots of uh, footnotes. And they're all jolly useful because the footnotes uh, refer to other books. They refer to all kinds of documentation that the author has uncovered in his research. A nice, really good old-fashioned map showing Cheshire. And for perhaps non-UK non residents watching this... Cheshire is a county in the northwest of England. You can see on this very old map, uh, it's tucked up between Lancashire uh, and here over here you've got Liverpool. Uh, so you've got Lancashire, Staffordshire, and Flintshire, which is in Wales. So it's up in that part of the world. Uh, we when we think of Cheshire, we think of towns like Chester, for example, and the Birmingham area. So, there's a lot of text. You can see it's quite dense. Um, military operations. What I like, they've got some really simple maps. They're not fancy maps. They're very uncomplicated and therefore very clear. They show you just exactly uh, what you need to know. Uh, and very clearly marked. There's Chester uh, by the estuary there. Uh, Whitchurch. Nutsford, Warrington, Middlewich, Nantwich. These are places whose names crop up time and time again. Um, lovely quotations at the start as well. Some old soldiers for sergeants do would do wondrous well. Uh, lovely. Lots of engravings. Sorry, if you can hear the children shouting in the garden. Here we are in lockdown and a very hot day, so I've got the windows open. <laughs> Sorry if you're disturbed by the noise of children playing outside. Not my children, I hasten to add. Uh, a letter from Sir William Brereton to a member of the House of Commons in 1642. Uh, Sir William Brereton's account of the Parliamentarian victory at Middlewich on the 13th of March, 1643. Um, Photograph the battlefield of Hopton Heath from the royalist position. Um, where's this? Halton Castle from the southwest. Uh, here we go. Church of St Michael. Uh, bridge crossing the Dee between Farndon and Holt. So what we're talking about here is uh, all the original background and uh, the history of... Um, the, that particular bit of the Civil War in this area. Then we've got January to November 1644, more like lions than men, so moving forward in the Civil War. This is just, if you like, chronology. This is literally a history of what happened during these particular periods. Uh, this is the battlefield of Malpass from the southwest. Um, so again, this is really good. This is this is probably the bit of the book that the general reader will enjoy the most because it's effectively history of the Civil War in this era. Then we move on to the latter part, uh, the present expedition against Cheshire, January 1645 to February 1646. Um, and so it goes on. Nice photograph here of bullet marks in the north wall of the Tower of St Peter's Church in Farndon. Uh, musket ball bullets of course uh, but yes very clear you can very clearly see the indentations in the brickwork and they've been there standing there for crikey 350 getting on for 400 years now my goodness me um yes we have a lot of history in the uk don't we and sometimes it's easy to overlook it uh, south view of beeston castle there's a couple of lovely engravings here, not from British sources, actually. Uh, this one here is Stefano della Bella, Soldaten di Canon Alvuren, so depicting an artillery battery firing, and that's in from Amsterdam. And here's another one, uh, Stefano della Bella, uh, Slagfeld mit Soldaten te part in Gefecht, in other words, a cavalry battle. Very nicely atmospheric, showing, you know, the kind of... 
a look that fighting of the time would have. Uh, where's this southwest prospect of the city of Chester? Um, I've got one of my patrons who's also an amazing map maker, Alyssa Faden. She's uh, mad about Chester. I think she comes from Chester. Don't you, Alyssa, if you're seeing this? Um, and uh, often on her Facebook feed, she posts really old photos from, Chesh uh, from Chester. And um, uh, I don't think she's ever posted anything quite that old, though. That was actually produced in 1728. But um, people who are local to that area, I'm sure you'll find this fascinating. Here we are, the repaired breach in Chester's city wall near the new gate. And you can see, actually, I don't know if you can see in the video, the change in the brickwork showing where it's been patched up. You've got to look out for these things when you're out and about. Obviously a bit difficult at the moment. Uh, this is where it starts getting interesting because the book contains a lot of tables. And... It uh, basically shows um, the order of march and the uh, the number of troops. Uh, one of the things that um, slightly irritates me is that they've decided. I don't know if this is from the original sources, but it's. I find it um, a bit confusing. Is instead of just saying one hundred. They've got a zero in front, just so that every uh, number in the column has the same number of digits. They've put a zero in front, so zero one hundred, zero zero sixty, zero two hundred, total uh, eleven hundred and sixty. Now, I, I've not really got many criticisms of this book from what I've seen. It looks like an amazing piece of work, but I do find that rather distracting. I'm sure it would have been easier to just put 160 and so on, and we're capable of working out that, you know, there's, a, you know, there doesn't need to be that zero in front. I also would prefer it when you've got numbers that are being add up added up as accountancy does or your microsoft excel that numbers like that are aligned right in the table cell so that they sit over on the right hand side um, rather than on the left but that's just me being really pernickety i just have to find that slightly odd and you can see that the same things happened here and you're going to see it happening in other tables it's a minor criticism but it is an irritation it's just me being pernickety, folks. Right, uh, now we get onto the part of the book, part two, that I think is going to be the bit that really starts to turn on war gamers, particularly war gamers interested in campaigning and raising specific bits of an army for their own miniature armies. Identifying, paying, equipping and feeding an army. This is brilliant stuff. Anatomy of an Army 1, Recruitment and Organisation. And this is where there's some bits in this book where they get wonderfully specific. It's, it makes for quite exciting reading. You, you start to feel quite involved, even if you're only kind of um, flipping through. Another atmospheric image here uh, from Jacques Caillot, Rekrutieren van Soldaten, 1633, showing the recruitment or mustering of foot soldiers um, in Holland somewhere. Lovely illustration. Um, then we've... Uh, there's lots of quite interesting quotations coming in. Uh, here we go. Uh, some indication of the conscious decisions made by some leaseholders is contained in a petition of William Davenport of Bramhall, received from his tenants on 17th of September 1642, in response to his call for their support in raising a regiment or troop under his command and in the name of the king. They wrote... We, your worshipful tenants, having these many days with sad spirits weighed not only the woeful distractions of our kingdom, but also the present standing that is betwixt your worship and ourselves, have thought it our duty, as well as for the working up of sweet union, as for the taking away of all jealousies among us, to present your worship with these few lines of our humble request. We therefore request that either you would be pleased to bend our intentions that way which we may with upright hearts and safe consciences cleave to you, both in life and death, or else that your worship will not repute us ill-affected or false-hearted 
tenants in refusing to venture our lives and consciences do persuade us are not good or lawful nor such as we dare safely and with good consciences maintain and defend you in for howsoever we would not for the world harbour a disloyal thought against his majesty yet we dare not lift up our hands against that honourable assembly of parliament whom we are confidently assured do labour both for the happiness of his majesty and all his kingdom so basically they're saying to him now we don't want to join your army we don't want to join the king's army to fight against parliament uh, that's quite a thing can you imagine the effect that a letter like that would have had um and it carries on you know talking about how uh william davenport responded extraordinary times these were extraordinary times setting brother against brother landlord against tenants and so on now <clears throat> talking of more detail this is where it gets really into the nitty-gritty Table 3, Sir William Brereton's Regiment of Horse, 13th, 30th of April, 1645. And it, the breakdown is wonderful. Sir William Brereton's own troop under Major Sankey, strength 100 men. Lieutenant Colonel Michael Jones, strength, and again, here's this irritating leading zero, 70 men. Colonel Duckenfield, 60 men, and so on all the way down to Captain Carter with 40 men, making a total of 790 men. You've actually got all the individual officers' names. This is wonderful. If you're creating a small force, like, you know, relatively small force, like the Cheshire Army, and we've actually got the names of the people involved, the names of the troop commanders, the names of the company commanders. Here's uh, the regiment of foot. So that's the regiment of horse. This is the regiment of foot on the 30th of April. Sir William Brereton's own company under the conduct of Lieutenant Colonel Venables, 150 men. Sergeant Major Croxton, 160 men. Captain Sadler, about 70 men. Captain Gimbert's Dragoons. 60 men, Captain Rathbone, 80 men, and so on and so forth. Captain Holt's Firelocks, 80 men. This is fantastic stuff. You know, if you've ever wondered, oh, I wonder how many figures I should have in a troop of horse. Well, it varied according to how many each captain had, been managed, had managed to raise. And then they come together to form the regiment. Uh, here we are again, Colonel George Booth's Regiment of Foot, Colonel Henry Brooks' Regiment of Foot, Colonel Robert Duckenfield's Regiment of Foot, Colonel John Lee's Regiment of Foot. Over the pages, uh, Colonel Henry Mannering's Regiment of Foot. Remember Captain Mannering? Now, this is interesting. They've got a total of 160 men. We haven't actually got the, the breakdown there of the individual troops. We can take a guess that it was probably something around 40 men each. You know, four forties make 160. Um, so the Cheshire Army strength on the 30th of April, 1645, 790 horse, 4,140 foot, totaling 4,930 men. Now, that's fantastic, isn't it? <clears throat> 4,930 men. I would say pretty much any war gamer can muster a force that's around about 5,000 men. That's brilliant. That's a real war game sized force, isn't it? Uh, then we go on, to, we've got to comparative numbers. Sir William Brereton's Regiment of Horse from October, later that year, October 1645. <clears throat> and again, we get the breakdown. Uh, we've got Arquebusiers, no specific strength given there, but his own troop, about 120 men, and so on and so on and so forth, to 910 men. And then his regiment of foot, again, another breakdown. And a really fascinating little record here of the muster roll of Cheshire forces at Litchfield Close on the 23rd of May, 1646. This is brilliant. Look at this. How specific is this? Sergeant Major Daniel, Lieutenant Heath, Ensign Witter, three sergeants, two drums, three corporals, one gentleman of arms, and 92 common soldiers. And then Captain Booth, one sergeant, one drum, two corporals, 
48 common soldiers, Captain Ledbetter, Lieutenant Norbury, Ensign Baniel, one sergeant, one drum, two corporals and 33 common soldiers. And the note is these two make but one company and officers are allowed accordingly. And so it goes. This is fantastic. If you want to run a campaign where you actually have personalities involved in the campaign, this is like gold dust. I love this kind of stuff. So it, more about the recruitment here, the Cheshire Foot, the Cheshire Horse, a uh, nice illustration of some drummers on horse, the Cheshire Forces and Parliamentarian Associations, the Cheshire Dragoons. Dragoons, you shouldn't overlap Dragoons. Dragoons were pretty significant in the English Civil War. And as they say, dragoons were an essential part of 17th century armies, even though some contemporaries were uncertain about their precise role. Gervais Markham referred to them as a kind of footman on horseback, or mounted infantry who rode rather than walked to the battlefield, mainly employed in flexible operations where mobility was essential, naming the seizing of bridges and strongholds, raiding, reconnaissance, patrolling and foraging. And so it goes. The fact that it's referring to a specific regiment of dragoons just makes it even more interesting. <clears throat> Soldiers from Ireland in the Cheshire Army. The Irish have always played a part in the forces of Britain. And so it's natural that there should be Irishmen amongst the army in Cheshire. Then we go on to Anatomy of an Army 2, Leadership and the machinery of war. So here we are talking about the commanders, how the chain of command works, the officers. Here we go. A warrant issued by Captain John Brooke to the constables of Aston, dated 2nd of March 1644. Um, a nice, here we go, a nice musketry discipline image. Um, the trained bands and the role that they've played how they were raised, how they were trained, and so on. Uh, lovely. This, again, look how wonderfully specific it gets. Sergeant Major James Lothian's company of Broxton 100. This is magnificent, looking into this kind of detail. Stuff about artillery. Nice engraving of artillery. Uh, the principal types of ordnance. From the Gunner's Glass, 1646, so the Cannon Royal, the Cannon, the Demi Cannon, the Culverin, the Demi Culverin, the Saker, the Minion, the Falcon, the Falconet, and the Robinet. Tiny little Robinet. The Robinet had a ball weighing about three quarters of a pound, so something like 12 ounces, uh, whereas the Mighty Cannon Royal had a shot weighing 63 pounds. Obviously, that's the kind of thing used for sieges. But here we are. The names of the various master gunners and gunners present. Gunners belonging to the Stafford piece. All named. Look at this. Robert Wilden, master gunner. Robert Henman, gunner's mate. Abraham Ramsgate, quarter gunner. Thomas Tew, commissary to the magazine at Stafford. Richard Smith, carpenter and matross. Abraham Jordan, matross. Uh, Robert Palthrop, matross. John Walton Matross, James Smith, boy to the company, John Smith, boy to the company, Humphrey Allett, wagoner, and all allowed three weeks' pay. Isn't that fantastic? That kind of detail, little nuggets like that. Pioneers, absolutely vital for the practice of siege warfare, of course. Medical services. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? We don't associate the English Civil War with having medical services, but here we are. We have people. Uh, here we go. Henry Hexham, writing in 1642, felt that each infantry company should possess a good barber surgeon to have skill in surgery that when the company watches in approaches and guards where there is danger, he may be at hand, in absence of the surgeon of the regiment, to bind up and dress hurt and wounded men. There we are. So they were thinking about these things. It may be crude by our standards. But there you go. And here we are, the, the names of the various surgeons. Mr Dunlop, John Chadwick, Thomas Harrington, and so on. The quartermasters. The muster masters. 
Uh, military intelligence. Again, probably not something we associate with the English Civil War, but here we are. There were people out and about spying, gathering intelligence, and so on. Fascinating stuff. And some named people again. Captain Thomas Steele. Um, and he's a cheese factory of Weston near Barthomley. He was described by Lancaster as a rough-hewn man. No soldier. Uh, fascinating. Who are these people? Buy the book and find out. They're thinking about the army's spiritual well-being as well. Some godly and learned ministers. And here they are again. This, this kind of detail is fantastic. Nathaniel Lancaster, Mr Adams, Mr Brennan, Samuel Eaton, Ephraim Elcock. And on it goes. All these people, ministers to look after the spiritual well-being of the men. The sinews of war, money, ammunition and provisions. And this is also where we start to see some illustrations uh, by Alan Turon. Uh, they're, they're quaint, I would say, the quality. We're not talking about an Osprey standards here. This is not Peter Dennis illustrating this. But nonetheless, they convey something about the uh, forces and the costumes. And they're rather characterful, I would say. I quite like them. Not bad, actually. They convey what, you know, as war gamers we need to know. There we go. The, the things that are really, as I mentioned at the start, kind of turn me on about this book, are actually the uh, wonderful uh, renditions of the standards and guidons um, by, uh, I think it's a Dr. Leslie Prince, um, who's done them for this book and they're lovely they are really lovely and all war gamers raising English Civil War units will find those an absolute boon fabulous uh, John Speed's map of Chester uh, contemporary map of Chester it's a bit dull as a reproduction I think they could have done with a bit more work in Photoshop to brighten it up but nonetheless it's a useful thing uh, a nice period painting. Oh, yes, we're used to this kind of thing. And this is uh, Gerard Tabosch, officer writing a letter with trumpeter, uh, circa 1648 to 9. Contemporary gives a really good impression. Very uh, familiar kind of scene we've seen. It's a bit like that famous painting, isn't it, um, associated with the English Civil War? You know, when did you stop beating your wife? <laughs> Um, a nice engraving, three uh, cavalrymen in combat. That's a nice little picture there. Uh, obviously, one of them is uh, a cuirassier or certainly wearing half armour, uh, whilst the other two are more lightly clad. Um, here's some really interesting material in the book. Um, Reconstruction of a grey russet soldier's coat by Ian Dicker and Barbara Robinson of the 1642 Taylor. That's really nice to see. Gives you some really good, interesting detail about how the clothing was made, the kind of material it was made from. That's useful stuff. And here's a reconstruction of a cavalry and dragoon riding coat. Again, I probably have used Photoshop a bit to brighten the image slightly to make it a little bit clearer but nonetheless very useful and uh, atmospheric photo this is a lovely one of a chap actually dressed as a mounted dragoon on a lovely kind of cob horse with big fluffy feet that's a lovely picture i think that's lovely very characterful there's something of the wild west about him don't you think you know move him on a couple of hundred years stick him out in the wild west i think he'd fit right in you might regret ha only having smooth balls, though. More detail. Lots of detail about the expenses. I mean, for example, just uh, my fingers landed on this. By the summer of 1647, Duck and Fields Regiment had received pay amounting to £5,444, 17 shillings and 7 pence, with £3,557 remaining outstanding. Lots of detail like that. Those of you who like to run campaigns and want to know how much you know you have to pay a soldier and what it costs to run a regiment, this stuff is fantastic. Um, let's have a look. 
moving through so there's lots of statistics lots of money being talked about here the kind of thing that i will just spend ages pouring over ammunition you can't go to war without ammunition so again the procurement of ammunition the expenses involved the shortages here we go shortages of powder and ammunition at the chester league and elsewhere were acute enough for the deputy lieutenants to purchase what they could locally upon account so parliament wasn't supplying them with enough ammunition so they had to go out and buy their own it's interesting how similar things persist throughout history um Really nice engraving here, you know, cavalry pistol tactics, infantry versus cavalry, cavalry with pistols versus lancers. Because, of course, this is still the period where cavalry would sometimes caracole. That is to say, pistol-armed cavalry would ride up, trot up to the enemy, discharge their pistols, turn around, go back to the rear of the formation where... On horseback, you imagine this, they would then reload their pistols and gradually work their way to the front of the unit again, bang, and back to the rear they go. And this is where people like Cromwell, who said, ha ha, we're not mucking about with that. We're going to charge à l'outrance with the sword. Um, they proved so effective. Uh, and of course, this is lessons as well being learnt from the Thirty Years' War, and it persisted as well onto the wars of the League of Augsburg, Louis the Louis the Fourteenth wars against Marlborough, and so on. A fascinating period of history. So, ammunition, provisions, lots of stuff about provisions. Again, I love this stuff. Cheese. Cheese was supplied to the army in significant quantities, although Cheshire was a county historically recognised for its production. Examples of payments for this commodity from the sequestrators of Bucklow 100 include £20, 10 shillings for 14 and a half hundredweight of cheese issued to Commissary John Miller in March 1643 for the use of the army in part sent from Dutton Demean. Wow. Cheese. Wallace and Gromit would be proud of this part of the book. This is fantastic stuff. Then we move on to standards, clothing, arms and equipment. And again, here we go. For the two trumpet banners, black taffeta at £5 a piece. £10 for two pairs of stirrups for the trumpeters at 15 shillings a pair. For the cornet staff, for the two cornets on black taffeta with silver and black fringe and taffeta of the same at £5 a piece. So just to sort out the trumpet banners and cornets, £17, 15 shillings. This is amazing. The, the detail that the author has unearthed is quite extraordinary. And on it goes. Taylor's bill or voucher for Sir William Brereton's troop, 7th of July 1643. Uh, 25 and a half yards of broad cloth at 10 shillings the yard. 27 and a half yards of narrow at 4 shillings the yard. Uh, one L of crimson scarf silk at 2 shillings the L. 10 pounds of black and red thread. Uh, for the trumpeters, two L's of silver parchment, uh, one and a half dozen coat buttons at tenpence each, uh, seven skeins of silk thread, and, 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 and. On it goes. This is fantastic detail. I love this. Um, bill or voucher for fabric and trimming supplied to Captain Robert Stukeley. 16 yards of frieze at four shillings a yard, six yards of Dutch jean at one shilling, shilling sixpence a yard, uh, two dozen trussers. We'll have to look up what a trusser is, <laughs> but it sounds fantastic. Amazing detail, absolutely amazing. I love it. Uh, drummer, fifer, and pikeman of the trained bands. Let's move on. Lots and lots of detail, absolutely fantastic. Uh, incredible detail um, all about clothing and equipping the Cheshire Army. Military units of the Cheshire Army of Parliament. This is where organising your war games army really starts to kick off. Sir William Brereton's regiment of horse, his own troop. Uh, this is again fascinating. You've got these personalities, the individual troop commanders named in this book and the raising of their particular subunits. This is 
incredible, incredible stuff. Clark John Griffith, Griffith mentioned with John Chadwick, surgeon to Brereton's troop on 14th of August 1644, various references to him, the various other people associated with them, a bit of biography where we have some biography for them. Uh, Captain Lieutenant Grant, named in a pay warrant for the troop, dated the 2nd of August 1645. He was killed in action at Roughton Heath, a pension of £8 being awarded to his widow Elizabeth on the 22nd of November 1648. These people come alive. They're jumping off the page. Sergeant Major John Brown's troop. Uh, Captain Lieutenant Francis Duckenfield. Lieutenant Colonel Chidley Coote's troop. And so on. Someone with my name, Cornet Lawrence Hyde, probably the eighth son of Robert Hyde of Norbury. In 1656, Lawrence married Dorothy, a sister of Colonel Henry Brooke. There we go. All these, Colonel Henry Mannering's troop. Uh, yeah, main wearing. People not familiar with English would say, but think of Captain Mannering of Dad's Army. That's how it was spelled. All these individual people just coming straight off the page. What more could you want? You could, I mean, something that's happening a lot lately is people running Discord campaigns. You know, online campaigns using the Discord kind of chat room software. This gives you a head start if you wanted to run an English Civil War campaign set in this part of the UK. All the personalities are there. It's an absolute joy. Then we've got Sir William Brereton's Regiment of Foot. And the same is true. All the various units. I'll speed up a little bit. Because you can see. For each of the units in the Cheshire Army. The same level of research has been done. Colonel George Booth's Regiment of Foot. This is fascinating. I, I hats off to uh, our author Andrew Abram because the amount of research that must have gone in to unearthing the biographical details of all these people amazing here we are Colonel Henry Brooks regiment of foot that's phenomenal you know the, the payments they received where they were where they went what happened to them did they survive did they die who were they associated with? Colonel Robert Duckenfield's Regiment of Foot. This is absolutely phenomenal work. Hats off. Here we are. Captain William Watson's company from Macclesfield. He was mayor from 1643 to 1644 and sequestrator of Macclesfield 100. Watson had received his commission as captain and raised his company foot by the 25th of January 1643. He served under Robert Duckenfield, blah, 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 blah. Colonel John Lee's regiment of foot. Uh, and here we are, some muster rolls survived for Gerard's company between 1643 and 1646. Look at this. So, it's 1643, 44 men. Uh, 1644, it gone up to 60 men. Uh, 1645, it went up again, 100, 123 men. Uh, the highest it reached was 120 and 130 men on the 23rd of May 1646. So that's a really interesting little insight there that a single company, part a constituent part of a regiment, fluctuated in size between as few as 44 men and as many as 130 men. You know, triple the size, more than triple the size. That's a really interesting detail. So what it also means, people, is. When you're coming to raising your wargaming units and someone looks at your wargame and says, oh, you got the wrong number of people in each company. It's like, really? Seriously? Look at what the historical fact is telling us, how wildly over time the strength of even a company can fluctuate. And of course, multiply that up for a regiment, whether a foot or horse or dragoons. Colonel Henry Mannering's regiment of foot. Uh, here's a list. This is fantastic. Uh, there we go, yeah. Um, 
there's a list of the actual soldiers. The ensign, sergeants and clerk of the unit remain known, however. In mid-1644, the remaining non-commissioners and men were, and they're named... Corporal Thomas Stubbs, Corporal Thomas Pownall, lots of lots of Thomases at this time, you notice this. Corporal Thomas Reed, Drummer William Moores, Drummer John Berry, John Tomkinson, Thomas Bowyer, Thomas Compton, Lester Smith, Peter Bramhall, Edward Stark, Thomas Barrows, and so on and so on and so forth. What a fantastic resource. I'm, you know, I'm blown away by this. I'm seriously blown away. And if you think you want to run a skirmish game... You can name the individual figures. That figure over there, write it under the base. That's William Book. That's Edward Barlow. That's Adam Marx. These are real people. Imagine the sense, you know, the extraordinary sense that would give you running a game where you've actually got named individuals in your game represented by your miniatures. Extraordinary. More details of the various companies. Sir William Brereton's Regiment of Dragoons, and we mentioned Dragoons earlier, they're a really interesting component of an English Civil War army. And uh, here we are. We've got a whole load of records. Look at this. Again, list of the Dragoons, the individual Dragoons. Isn't that amazing? I think that's amazing. How they've managed to track down all these names, that's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Fantastic work. Uh, at horses, of course, this is an interesting thing. When you're running a cavalry or dragoon regiment, the number of horses you have, of course, if you're dragoons, that affects your mobility. So, received in London, 60 horses. When they got to Cheshire, another 14. Sir George Booth donated 14 horses, giving them 88 horses. Then, horses lost upon service. Lost at Salt Heath, Hopton Heath. 34 Dragoon horses were killed. At Hammer, 8 and so on. At Loppington, heavy casualties again, 27 horses lost. At Longford, 24 horses lost. At Kelso extraordinary so in total they lost 128 horses wow well there's they received 88 but lost 128 so there's obviously some more additions along the way and more losses but it sounds like they may have ended the war with quite a few men on foot um, and the arms they received firelocks that's fascinating detail well, we're nearly at the end here, folks. All I can say is you can tell I'm salivating. Um, absolutely. And uh, here we are, um, captions to the colour plates that we passed in the middle of the book. And then an extensive bibliography, all the different manuscripts they've consulted, printed primary sources, and then secondary sources, books and edited collections, and so forth. Wow, there's a lot of research has gone into this publication. Hugely, hugely impressive. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, this has been a bit of a rambling and very much in detail, page by page look through this book. All I can say is, if you're a fan of the English Civil War, if you're interested in the 17th century, military history of the 17th century, if you're a war gamer who wants to raise an interesting and unusual army for the war games table and you're thirsty for the detail in order to do that, what can I say? This book hits the mark in so many ways. If I was going to give out of five star reviews like as, as one does on Amazon, even just through this flick through... I, how could I not give it, basically, five out of five stars? That is an incredible piece of work. And the, as I say, the only source of irritation I have in the entire book 
is the way that some of those the, the numbers in the tables have been rendered with that leading zero which are just you know irritates me but that's such an insignificant thing in the balance you know maybe that means out of a hundred i would only give it 99 <laughs> but a seriously fantastic piece of work uh beautifully designed and laid out uh, lovely illustrations useful illustrations as well they're not just kind of random things they add to our understanding of the period they add to our understanding of what's being talked about in the book so ladies and gentlemen more like lions than men by andrew abram from helion and co available direct from helion and co and of course through all good primarily at the moment it, because of the lockdown online bookshops uh, highly recommended hope you found this review useful and i'll see you again next time bye